Hello, everybody, and welcome to Knowledge is Power. Welcome to Knowledge is Power. This, we're having a discussion on the voting rights and the registration drive to increase awareness of the different voting rights that we all have as individuals, as citizens in the community in the Washington metro area, Virginia, Maryland. And we have the Washington Bar Association as our panel guests, oh, in partnership with the Community Church of Washington, D.C., UCC. In addition to looking at how to effectively vote and what things are out there, we're also going to look at what are some of the ways that folks are being repressed, suppressed from voting. And so this is really a panel that's going to help to empower the community and individuals to know how to ensure that everyone's right to vote is protected and is secured. So many folks will get to the polls on poll election day or maybe even put an absentee ballot in and and it may not get counted because of small things. So we have a very high level panel here today that will highlight the technicalities and to ensure that folks understand the dynamics that tries to prevent individuals from voting as much as we're also saying get out to vote. This time I'm inviting our moderator for this particular conversation, Knowledge is Power, very own Minister Brooke Taylor from the Community Church of Washington, D.C. Let's give her a hand as she comes to this time. Mr. Rudolph McGann, who is a staff attorney at the Office of the General Counsel, uh, District of Columbia, Board of Elections. Uh, next we have Ms. Marcia Johnson Blanco, co-director of the Voting Rights Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Third, we have Mr. Edward A. Hales, Jr., Managing Director and General Counsel for Advancement Project. And lastly, we have our very own trustee, Trevor Reeves, who is also an attorney at law. And um, criminal defense attorney for the Reeves Firm, LLC. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, have a panel discussion about some very important topics um, surrounding voter rights and education. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and start that up. This is the first presidential election in 50 years without the full protection of the Voting Rights Act, for those who may not have known that fact. Um, do you think it's harder to vote in 2016 than it, it has been in other years? In some ways, definitely. Um, but we are uh, talking about a uh, woke uh, generation who has uh, noticed in particular that there are some forces that want to make it more difficult for people to vote. And folks are, um, are, are finding ways to overcome those barriers in advance of this election and have been doing so um, um, after the, uh, the uh, 2013 decision by the United States Supreme Court to, uh, to take away the key provision of the Voting Rights Act that uh, required certain jurisdictions, particularly uh, uh, jurisdictions in the, the Deep South that had a history of uh, making it harder for people to vote. Um, and by taking away this requirement that, that, that forced these jurisdictions to submit any changes to their um, elections, uh, uh, procedures, practices, rules, requirements, and even polling place uh, relocations or changes to locations uh, to the Department of Justice for review to see if in, in any way it would harm uh, communities of color in particular, by taking that requirement away, uh, these jurisdic jurisdictions were free uh, to do what they've done in the past, and that is to make it harder for people to vote. Um, in, in many states, immediately after the Supreme Court decision, taking away that protection, put these new requirements in place. Uh, places like North um, uh, Carolina, where a monster voter suppression bill was put into place to cut back almost every um, uh, 
change that made it easier for people to vote. Early voting, same day registration, uh, uh, being able to register at age 17 so long as you were um, eligible and 18 by election day. All of these uh, changes were taken away. But it was blocked in court uh, because uh, Bruce decided that we're not going to allow these changes to make it harder for people to vote. So in some ways, yes, in some places, um, it will be harder, uh, but we know that there are a lot of advocacy organizations and uh, friendly election officials that are making sure people have uh, their right to vote protected. Thank you, Mr. Hales, and that's why it's so important that we do register, especially for these local elections, to get some of these things changed at the local level. It's not just about the presidential le uh, level. Uh, thank you for that. Anyone would like to follow up? What I would just add, I don't think it's harder, but it can be a bit confusing. You know, we're inundated with a lot of information. Um, there have been states, as Mr. Hales has said, that have been deliberately trying to make it harder for people to vote. And so it's important for um, folks here in the DMV to know what, what are the rules here. So Virginia, you need voter ID. In Maryland, you don't need voter ID. In D.C., you don't need ID. So if you hear, oh, you need ID to vote, some people might think, oh, I don't have an ID, I, I can't go vote. But if you're in Maryland, it's not a problem. And in Virginia, even though you need ID, it's a range of IDs. So know what that range is. And so it's because of the, uh, the amount of information and the fact that there have been states that have been trying to keep people from voting, there could be some confusion. And that's why you know, one of the goals that, of our election protection program that we're involved in is Here's a tool, here's a number you can call, any question you have. Because we want to make sure that you're educated enough and so that you can be empowered at the polling places, even when folks may be trying to make it a little more difficult with knowledge, power, and you'll be able to vote. Real point of clarification with respect to the ID in DC. If you voted already, you don't need an ID. However, if you send in a mail-in registration, this is your first time voting, you have to have some form of identification. That, that can be even a utility bill. You don't have to necessarily have a government-issued ID, which means something that verifies your address. And if you are same-day, election-day registration, so when you go to the polls to register, they're going to ask for ID because otherwise, you're going to have a live ballot, and they have to verify through that process that you're living where you say it. Thank you. Um, I would just say that's a really important clarification because under the Help American Vote Act, if you're a first time voter who sent your registra registration by mail, you do need to show ID, but after that, you're good. At least in Maryland and Virginia. I mean, I'm sorry, yes, it's Maryland and DC, not, not Virginia. And thank you all for this information. You're bringing light to just how tricky all of these laws are, especially in an area like this where you have three states very close to each other. It's very important to know all of the different um, laws in each area. Um, so Mr. Reeves, yes. we're coming on down to you. Um, I have two questions for you. We'll go with the first. Um, how can the African-American community especially hold the candidates responsible for addressing and providing solutions to our particular so with, should know how to work this, with holding our representatives accountable, it's the first thing that I would say is knowing who our representatives are in our areas and showing up and showing your face to different events to help educate yourself. And whether it's something as simple as with mainstream media these days, Googling your representatives, seeing what, what they vote on, what are the issues that they, where do they seem tend to lean, sorry, where they tend to lean on certain issues, and then making your face visible. And at that point, there's a step further, as we're sitting here today, we're talking about an election, actually your vote, your voice, and your power. And what we do tend to see is sometimes it gets a little um, discouraging at times, because me by myself, I have an issue or I see an issue in my community and I can't bring the amount of light that I need to that issue by myself. 
And then it's um, important for us to find other individuals in our community who share that same um, issue. And for me being a member of this church, being situated in this ward of DC, we've seen a lot of issues that the community has had. So what we try to do is have town halls with their elected officials and with the police chief so they know who the faces of these individuals are. And the next thing to do is to contact those individuals and this is, these are the problems that we're having in this community. And if they respond in the way that, you know, it's helpful to your community, you keep saying, I mean, you keep pounding them anyways with the things that are going on. If they don't respond, you have power in this thing called an election. And that individual does not have to represent your community or your area in the next um, cycle if you all get out and vote for someone who is willing to be a voice and a light in your community. Any follow-ups on what Ms. Reed presented? Okay, I do have a follow-up question for you before we move to the last question. Um, I see you're, you're wearing an organizational shirt. What can, our, what can our black Greek letter organizations do um, for the community, <laughs> for the community in the, this voted rights uh, struggle? Um, as I came here today, I really didn't know how I should dress for the panel. I was like, are they going to be dressed up? Are they going to be laid back? And um, one thing that we believe in Alpha Phi Alpha, that a hopeless people is a hopeless people. And so I decided that wearing this shirt today would help send that message. And one thing that, regardless of the letters that I've seen across the chest of my brothers and sisters in the African American community, one thing that I think is always beautiful is the way that we're able to come together on very important social issues. And at the top, along with education, I think voting is right up there for all of us. And the things that we have to do and that we continue to do is, um, I sit up here with other Greek letter organization individuals, is putting our faces out there and helping to educate our community, a community that's often overlooked, left behind, um, and sometimes ignored, if we're going to be quite honest about it. So it's our job to pick up the slack and carry that mantle and help to ensure that not only um, in the current, but in the future, that our legacy and that our communities will continue, but not only continue, that they will thrive and that they will be educated and have the knowledge and the power to say that I, myself, can influence change. Anyone else? That? <laughs> Again, well said, uh, Trevor. And I, 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 um, I, I, I know that Often people think that nonpartisan organizations can't influence elections, but in the same way that Trevor mentioned, um, th through voter education, through advocacy, there are a lot of ways to increase the number of people of color who participate in each election. And I know going back to um, uh, 1984 when uh, Reverend Jesse uh, Jackson ran as an Omega, I mean as a, as a president, um, that it put a spotlight on the large number of unregistered people who were not voting or the people who were registered but not participating. And he talked about the, uh, the, the, the rocks that David used to destroy Goliath. And so there's a way through, through nonpartisan organizations, including, of course, uh, through the church, that we lift up these narratives of, of disempowerment in our community in ways that we can tr be transformed and have power through voter education and voter participation. Thank you. And that led perfectly to our, our final question. Um, being that we're in a, a church right now, uh, what is the role of the church in the election, the election process, uh, Mr. Reeves? Um, I think um, Mr. Hales just touched on it to a degree. Um, I would say educate, empower, and enlighten. And for us as a church, um, as I said earlier, one thing that we've done in this community in general, noticing, and it's, I think it's extremely noticeable whether there have been issues of lack of grocery stores that are on 
the same level and quality as many others just in the district or in other areas of um, the DMV alone. And the um, low level um, police protection, it's heightened when there's something that's going on. But on a regular day, how hard it is to get the police or some type of emergency response when the individuals are having issues here in this community. I think as um, church bodies to <coughs> one, educate our communities on the power that they have. And I think the word is so important when it comes to their vote and their voice and what exactly are we saying when we cast those ballots for the individuals that we're voting for. And also to empower them as we were as you were saying earlier, to let them know that your vote does count and your vote does matter. It may seem smaller sometimes when you look at the Electoral College and the presidential election, but on the local level, the amount of change that you can bring to your situation by knowing who the individuals are that you're voting for and by casting that ballot and by enlightening them to the fact that you're educated and you're empowered and you have the ability to change the course of how life may appear or things may appear that are going around you um, for all the injustices and things that are unfair um, that are going on in the cities and in the nation. Uh, growing up, I was in the church quite a bit, um, at least three times. My mom was an ardent goer to church. I was an Episcopal. We were raised, I was raised in the Episcopal church. And what I noticed was that the church served as a community center where children in the neighborhood surrounding the church, I, and the other thing was I didn't live in the neighborhood the church was, was housed at. So we were coming in 20 minutes 25 minutes to get to church, and the neighborhood had a different socioeconomic background, which seems to always a lot of times be the case for the neighborhood, like especially around black church. I hate the stereotype, but churches are placed in um, lower socioeconomic areas where people come into the area from outside of it and have no connection really to the people that actually live in the area. So, what I see is the church being as a place to bring the neighborhood where it's housed in so that they can have an understanding of who is actually running. So the church necessarily has to be in a, a constituency that's going to be running, right? An ANC member is, this is in a single member district. Has the church had all the candidates for that single member district in to talk to the parishioners and the community at large to let them know this is what I stand for, this is what I want to do in terms of if you elect me, if you'll have me as your ANC commissioner, that's on a lower level, then you go to the ward level. Who's running for Ward 8? You know, and find out if they can come to your church because your church is located in Ward 8 and you have a community around the church. So not only would it, to me, increase the amount of people that are coming to your church for things that may not be necessarily related to the religious aspect of church, but the community aspect of church, you know? And if you have that, I think people will come into your church that may not necessarily come in for church, but come to the church to get a part and to be, have more of a greater sense of their community. So that, that's what I see it as from a sectarian, secular view, you know, coming at it government side that we use your church the churches for polling places. Why can't it be more than that? Why can't it be uh, an avenue or a venue for the candidates to come and voice with their opinions? And I'm sure a lot of churches do this. I, I'm just speaking generally, but yeah, to me that seems like something that can happen. Thank you for that. And one other thing I wanted to share with you, you know, the church can do a lot, particularly what you're doing today is providing education and resources to the community about how they can use their voice on the issues they care about. And you know, Mr. Hills mentioned that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is no longer in effect. And one of the consequences of that is that we no longer know what changes are happening in local communities, particularly in the South, that affects voting rights and that could have a discriminatory impact on minority voters. And what our organizations have done, and we're doing a lot of work in Georgia, is, uh, for example, as we reached out to the church because the church knows what's happening in the community 
you know, you can bring the information to the community, but you also know what's going on within the community. And so now, when we want to know what's happening locally, particularly in the southern jurisdictions, that's a source for us is the, the church, because someone in the community, in the church community, knows what's happening. And we can team up and work together to address it. So the church just provides a very powerful voice in the community, and just what you're doing here today is what's needed at this time. If I may, this is why I do this work. I mean, I, I, I come here in my capacity as, as a civil rights attorney, but I'm an ordained Baptist minister. And the church is a place of truth, freedom, and connectedness. And the church represents and hears the voices of the last, the lost, the least, the unlucky, and the unloved. It's not only people who come into the church, but the church goes out to the community. Uh, it was the, the prophet Ezekiel who was told to leave the mountaintop where a lot of esoteric conversations take place and to go down in the valley. Because in the valley there were people who didn't have power. Let me stop. Right? You know I was going to talk about the people that were the holes that were not only dry, but they were very dry. And there are a lot of places where there are dry votes. Where people need to hear the voice of prophecy, of truth and freedom to bring them together. And if you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll see that when the church started prophesizing to those dry bones, there was a lot of noise. And when the noise comes in the community and people start coming together, an army of folks who can come together and bring power to our community. Amen. That's why the church. Oh, oh, I can ask for one more thing from this lovely panel. Um, we're just going to ask, you know, for a short clip, one sentence, two sentence max, if you can tell us why you're so passionate about getting people registered to vote, or, you know, what, be, what is the most important thing to you about this, just one or two sentences, we're going to focus on the camera on each person for that. As Brother Reeves uh, spoke about, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha. Uh, I'm also a member, and uh, one of our our central uh, tenets is that a voteless people is a hopeless people. It was a, a, a central mission and policy of Alpha Phi Alpha to get as many people registered to vote so they can be part of the political process. Um, before we actually had the right to vote, you know, we, you know, we came up from slavery, we got out of slavery, and then we didn't have anything. So we fought for everything we've had that hasn't ended now. So I will see until we don't have to fight anymore, I'm gonna be in the process and trying to get people as registered and get people to vote. I mean, even when we get people to register to vote, our voter turnout, black, white, just university across the board is in the is in the teens, the high teens, maybe the twenties. We need to do better than that. As a people, as a country, you know, not just black people, everybody. We need to vote, and that's the only way the system works. You know, the polarization we have right now probably wouldn't be that way if more people actually exercise their right to vote. So that's all I have. I think we need to increase the, the concern about where our country's going. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> so we're going to ask the and you know, there's a saying that a democracy is the worst form of government, except when compared to all others. Yeah. <laughs> so this democracy that we have depends on us participating. And if we don't participate, then our democracy gets taken over by those who don't represent our interests. And the Supreme Court, in a case in the 60s, when they were looking at voting rights laws, said voting is preservative of all other rights. If you don't have a right, if you don't use and exercise your voting rights, then your right to housing, health care, education, employment, all of that is affected. So you, voting is the starting point of a conversation with your elected officials about what you want and what you think is important. And if you don't exercise that right, then you're giving up your voice and you're letting down your country. And we're now moving into an election cycle after a midterm election where we had the lowest 
voter turnout in over 70 years. And we really need to turn that around. And the only way we turn that around is by each one of us doing what we need to do to make sure that we vote and have our voice heard. I attended uh, Howard University, and as an undergrad, I was a political science uh, major, and I learned then that uh, that political science is the study of who gets what, where, when, and how. And in order to get what we need for our community to be highly developed, uh, our children to receive a, a quality education, for us to live free and safe, uh, we need to vote. And uh, because of all the rights secured by the blood of too many Americans, that is more precious than the right to vote. Uh, right now in our nation, uh, uh, African Americans and Latinos make up almost 30% of the electorate. Mm -hmm. And every single day, 90% of the growth in population is among people of color. And so we're moving to a nation where we will definitely have power more power than we have now, and that's why um, our white counterparts are trying to make it as hard as possible to hold on uh, to power as long as they can. But we're not going to let them stop us. No. Uh, for myself, I remember when I was a really, really young boy, and I'm not really too far removed from that now. <laughs> um, I, as I look back at it, I lived in this bubble. Because like everyone votes, you have the right to vote, everyone gets out and voting. You get older and that bubble gets burst. Mm -hmm. And you start to not only see, but you actually begin to experience growing up in the South, the things that people do to keep you down or keep you away or push you down when it comes to you exercising that right to vote. And for myself, I was um, sharing with Reverend Hales here, how this will be my first general election in the DMV area. I've lived up here for actually six years now. I retained my registration in Florida as long as President Obama was running because I felt that I needed to be on the ground down in the state of Florida because you know the state of Florida, we have a lot going on when it comes to election time, period. And I think it's so important for us to realize how strong of a voice we have when we all come together. Lift every voice and sing. And when we lift every voice, the amount of power that will come through that microphone, that megaphone, that is our ballot on election day is so strong. But until we're at the point where we're lifting every voice, as the brother said earlier, until there's no reason to fight, I'm here. And we're here. That's right. Amen.